was uh, 2002 that a vote came up in the Senate on whether or not to raise fuel efficiency standards. And it was defeated uh, by a fairly large margin. I think it was 61 to 39. And the reason that we had we lost so badly was that the labor unions had sided with the automakers in opposing raising fuel efficiency standards. And we realized at that point that we needed to have labor unions on the side of environmentalists rather than continue to be divided by industry. And the, you know, so we started a process, several of us at the same time, started a process of thinking about what could bring together labor unions, environmental groups, businesses, and community groups or community leaders, including civil rights leaders. And where we came to was a, a bigger, more positive vision than the environmental movement has traditionally had around issues like global warming or air pollution. In the past, we've focused a lot on the problem. And what the call for a new Apollo project does is it gets us focused on a big solution, one that a lot of different groups can see themselves in, including auto workers uh, in terms of making the cars of the future, so, you know, community leaders in terms of creating good jobs that benefit uh, communities of color, low-income communities, but also uh, white working class communities. Environmentalists can see themselves in it because this is a way to accelerate our transition to clean energy. And businesses, of course, tend to make a lot of money uh, as part of this new economy. So Apollo is a way of being solution-oriented and uh, sort of visionary and bold rather than being focused on a narrow solution to a narrowly defined problem. There's two big sources of uh, global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. It's uh, from burning oil to power our cars and our vehicles, and it's also uh, burning coal and other uh, fossil fuels for our electricity. And Apollo says that we need to be addressing both simultaneously. Uh, it says that we can create new cars that use far less gas and eventually are, using, are burning hydrogen or using some other kind of battery and that we can be using solar, wind, geothermal, biomass, a whole range of other sources for our electricity. But a lot of us have not, had not seen that all of these energy issues were interconnected. And we, we, you know, there's an, there's been an assumption for the last 20 years that the way to win environmental reforms was to go problem by problem by problem. And what Apollo says is, hey, when we have a big, bold, visionary uh, solution that benefits a lot of different people, we'll gain the power that we need in order to finally get it through the various state legislatures and the national and the federal government. Apollo is, a, um, is the god of the sun, uh, but it's also an homage to John F. Kennedy's space program, uh, putting a man on the moon and bringing him back home safely to Earth uh, within 10 years. And we think we need a similar goal to become uh, uh, independent of foreign oil in a very fast period of time. We're saying 10 years. Uh, we're saying that we need to accelerate our transition to clean energy. Uh, the economy, you know, the American economy needs it. Our environment needs it. Uh, Apollo is um, really addressing three major crises that are facing the United States right now. Our dependence on foreign oil makes us less able to deal with those countries that are supporting terrorism, like Saudi Arabia. Uh, our economy, we're getting left behind the industries of the future. Japan has increased its global market share of solar panels from 25 to 50 percent over the last five years. The Europeans dominate 90 percent of wind turbine production. Uh, we're getting left out of those industries and we need to make a strategic investment in them as a country in order to catch up. And of course the th third major crisis that's facing America is global warming. The subject of a major uh, summer a disaster movie called The Day After Tomorrow, which is uh, hopefully will raise some more awareness and get people to understand that we need big solutions to this big problem. Apollo starts from the premise that America is a can-do country and that we've faced tough times before and every time we've responded in a bold way and that brought the country together and made us stronger. So after the Civil War, Lincoln uh, built the railroads, which allowed an enormous amount of economic activity and trade within our own borders. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, President Eisenhower justified the interstate highway system uh, as a way to uh, protect ourselves uh, during the Cold War. Um, and in the 1960s and 70s, the Defense Department essentially guaranteed the market for microchips and created what is now the Internet uh, through a, a major federal initiative, major strategic investments. We can do the same thing again by making strategic investments and essentially guaranteeing the market for wind, 
solar hydrogen fuel cells and create incentives for buying um, hybrid cars, uh, joint investments at the federal and the state level in mass transit, uh, and really one of the less glamorous but uh, really most powerful way to uh, reduce uh, global uh, warming pollution is by making our buildings and homes more energy efficient. And I'll give you an example. In our st we, we hired a corporate economist out of Texas, uh, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Ray Perryman, uh, who had done some work for the Bush administration looking at their tax cut proposals, and he has some of the most sophisticated economic models available. And he uh, took a look at what we were proposing, which is a $30 billion annual investment over 10 years, and ran it through a series of his economic models. And what he discovered was pretty incredible. He found that Apollo would not only create 3.3 million new jobs over a 10-year period, but that the program would actually pay for itself. And the way that it does that is about two-thirds of, of the investment return is coming from energy efficiency. So it's the, the, the savings on energy costs that provide so many of the billions of dollars um, that will be invested to make those efficiencies. And those numbers actually increase. In other words, it becomes more cost-effective over the long term. Um, and the other place that it will become useful is by, by having some dominance in these new industries, the United States will be able to sell these products, lower our trade deficit, and lower our budget deficit at the same time. Um, so, you know, to give you an example, when I moved into my new home, I had a cable internet installed, high-speed internet installed, and the young man um, who came here was working a good job. He's a skilled worker. Uh, he, you know, installed uh, the cable um, internet. I think he's probably a union member. Uh, you know, very courteous, uh, you know, very good at his work. Um, under an Apollo project, guys like that should then be able to turn around to me and offer to come on in and, and, and make my whole house energy efficient, uh, offer to put solar panels on my roof, and be able to set up the financing so that it essentially costs me less every month in my energy bills to buy all of those uh, energy efficiency and clean energy solutions. So that's one of the visions is that you're going to create a huge number of jobs that are essentially self-financing as part of this transition to clean energy. Yeah. Our state is wealthy in natural and clean energy sources and we just really haven't put the investment money there to create those uh, new industries. And really it's at a time when I think a lot of people recognize that we do need, the, the nation and California in particular need to come together and really be helping to uh, fund and get started these new industries. I mean, we have to remember that companies like Intel and Microsoft and the whole high-tech revolution simply wouldn't have happened if the Defense Department hadn't guaranteed the market for microchips back in the 1960s. We wouldn't have the internet today had the federal government not created it in the 1960s and 70s, really, thanks to the Department of Defense. We can do the same thing again, and there's no better place to do it than California. State Treasurer Phil Angelides, who has been an absolute leader um, on this and a real visionary, has uh, asked the California uh, Public Employee Retirement System and the California uh, State Teachers Retirement System, which are major pension funds, to invest $2 billion into energy efficiency and clean, in in clean energy industries. And we've been working hard with the investment officers at those two institutions to direct those investments, not just to futuristic R&D work in other countries, perhaps, but really make those investments here at home in California so that we can start creating jobs before the end of this year um, as part of this uh, new Apollo project proposal. So by the end of this year, uh, we're, we're hoping to be able to announce that several uh, hundred, maybe several thousand jobs have already been created with private equity um, that, are, that are moving into this new space. Every municipality, every county, there's something that they can do. So people need to understand that our, the way that we've set up our buildings and our homes um, is so inefficient that there's essentially money on the table and that cities and counties can do what San Francisco has done, which is for the voters to essentially say, we're going to extend a line of credit to the city to retrofit old buildings, to invest in solar panels, and make smart investments that we think will more than pay for themselves over the long term. They called it a revenue bond because instead of going into debt, what the public of San Francisco gets is actually a really high return on their investment. So this could be done by really every city and every county in the United States to make a negotiation with their local power provider um, to be able to capture those energy cost savings that we invest in and at the same time 
obviously generating a lot of really good new jobs for people who need them. We hired a really prominent Texan corporate economist, a PhD from Rice University, who actually had done some work for the Bush administration to take a look at what would be the impact in terms of creating jobs and also what would be the, the revenue to, uh, the, to the taxpayer from making these strategic investments. I mean, the premise of Apollo is that you have to spend money to make money. And um, he's actually gone through our proposal and calculated the number of jobs and the amount of revenue that would be created. And he's really quite bullish on the whole proposal. He became quite an enthusiastic supporter for a fairly staid uh, economic uh, expert. For example, uh, uh, well, so part of it is the, the first part of it is our is our is the principles of Apollo, and this is a ten-point plan. It's easy to read. It takes about two minutes to read, and you can get a good sense of who we are and what we stand for. Um, you know, we start with vehicles, more advanced technology and hybrid cars, more efficient factories, what we're calling high performance buildings, or some people call them clean or green buildings. Uh, not the most exciting thing in the world, not as sexy as hydrogen cars, but really a huge uh, source of revenue um, and job creation. And then we go through each of the proposals and we calculate out what's the total investment, what's the gain to the GDP, what is the personal income gain to, to Americans, and what are the total number of jobs. And you can see the top line numbers here, a 300, um, a, a roughly a $313 billion budget investment would yield 3 million new jobs and uh, more than pay for itself in, in just a 10 year period. And then we go through each of the various line items, high performance buildings, bioenergy, um, and that's, you know, it's all in here. One of the great things about Apollo is that we'll have various uh, clean energy enthusiasts call us up and say, you know, are, are you guys for geothermal? And we say, absolutely, we're for geothermal. You know, are you for biodiesel? We love biodiesel. So I think where sometimes environmentalists have gotten themselves into a trap is they sort of say, well, I stand for these things, but the other things aren't our issue. What we're saying is that community health uh, you know, our children's health, the future of our planet and global warming, foreign policy and terrorism, these are all interconnected and, and that a new Apollo project has a vision for how all of these things can simultaneously improve. Apollo would just say, let's start with the good news. M most people wake up in the morning and uh, they're actually trying to reduce the number of things that they have to worry about. Uh, they're not trying to increase the number of things that they have to worry about. So we, now we hear, you know, that we've been overfishing and 90% of the fish that we eat in the oceans are gone. You know, uh, that thousands of species are on the verge of going extinct. Rainforests are disappearing. It's just a litany of bad news. And the, what, what happens is that when you focus on the problems, they appear disconnected and they make us feel powerless. When you focus on the solution, especially big and bold solutions, it really illuminates how all of these issues are connected and how they can all be simultaneously uh, solved and addressed. It's not going to be easy. That's why we're you know, saying we need a 10-year program. Uh, but it's not going to get any, um, it, it, it's certainly uh, not going to be easy if we deal with them, if these problems one by one. Um, so we're saying that we need to deal with these problems in a big way by addressing them all with a major solution. And part of it is starting with the good news first, and there's a lot of good news. Part of the good news is that, uh, is that the price of wind energy has come down dramatically. So even without exten you know, extensive uh, government subsidies, uh, wind energy is becoming competitive in many parts of the country. The challenge of wind is that the energy is not storable, right? So you, can't, you have to use the energy once it's being produced, um, in contrast to coal, where you can just burn more coal when you need more of it. But um, that's good news. It means that in a situation where wind, you know, for example, my um, brother-in-law used to work, uh, works at Boeing as an engineer. And uh, when he was just starting out, uh, they were making some of the, the highest quality wind turbines. And then Reagan came in and cut the tax credit for, for wind. So part of a lot, a lot of what's in Apollo, is, um, a lot of what we're calling investment are actually um, strategic tax breaks for corporations. So what Apollo says is it says all tax cuts are investments. So the question is what kind of a return do you get on that investment? Bush has given billions of dollars worth of tax cut investments 
to the wealthy and we haven't seen any return on that investment. What Apollo says is let's make more selective, more strategic tax cuts in particular industries that generate an immediate return for the taxpayer and for the planet. So you'll see that um, Apollo, the policy prescriptions in Apollo aren't new and we're actually quite proud of the fact that we've borrowed, we're standing on the shoulders of the outstanding policy work that's been done for the last 30 years. What Apollo does is it says instead of just going piece by piece why don't we embrace a program that does it all at once. Um, and what you find is that they all work together so you actually need to develop hydrogen fuel cells and other forms of storing energy to really capture the potential of wind. Uh, you need to extend a tax credit to to wind so that it's it's actually cheaper than traditional energy sources. Um, you have to really ramp up production of solar panels so that the cost comes down. Going little by little is not getting us there nearly fast enough. You have to encourage um, increased demand through uh, clean energy uh, standards at the state level. You also have to invest in the production side so that there's enough production to meet that demand and so that it comes down in price. Um, the Japanese have been making big commitments into solar panels. In fact, one of their factories, I believe in Tennessee, uh, is a unionized uh, solar panel factory. I think it's Sharp that runs it. Uh, General Electric just um, bought up all of Enron's uh, wind business, and I think they even pulled back many of their wind contracts from Europe and brought them back to the United States. Uh, so there is a lot happening in the United States. What we want to do is we want to focus on the good stuff and build that up build, up, build up on our strengths rather than endlessly focusing on all of our challenges. Uh, how do you ensure though that people realize the value of the solutions if they don't understand the seriousness of the problem? That's I think people do understand the seriousness of the problem. Um, I, think that, uh, I think that they understand it in their bones. And I think when we went and did some focus groups in Pennsylvania to figure out how to talk to swing voters, people that generally are called Reagan Democrats because they're registered as Democrats and they've been voting for Republican presidents. And these are blue collar, uh, you know, working families, working men and women. And we just sat down and we asked them, we said, how are things going around here? And they proceeded to describe all the factories that had been shut down over the years. These are folks who were making twenty, thirty dollars an hour in good factory jobs that paid their health care and retirement benefits and now they're working jobs at Walmart that pay you know seven, eight, nine bucks an hour that don't have any benefits. They have to work two jobs just to barely make ends meet uh, when before they worked one good job. They're, they're also, they also know that um, they don't really feel like they're contributing really important uh, returns to the American public. So working at a Walmart is just not as satisfying as building wind turbines or solar panels. And these guys, you know, these are big burly, uh, you know, union worker, factory workers in Pennsylvania. They waxed poetic about solar panels. They loved solar. They loved the, the vision of an American auto industry that's competitive with Japan once again. They loved uh, the idea of building really high class, um, difficult to produce uh, steel uh, wind turbines. They love the idea of building mass transit throughout the Midwest uh, so that it's not so dependent on, um, on airports and, and flight. Uh, there's a whole world of economic development that can happen just in the Midwest that would really revitalize the core of the United States which is currently being hollowed out by globalization. So the, the sense that something needs to happen is there. What we found is that when we were able to talk to people and reach them in their hearts about what matters to them most, which is having a good job, having a means to support their family, they were willing, at that, after they felt like this vision covered that part of their lives, they became very um, articulate about the need to address things like global warming, uh, to address our dependence and our addiction to foreign oil. Uh, but the key thing about Apollo is that we start where people are at, and that's around jobs. And we're doing the same thing in San Francisco. So, you know, the folks in, um, in Hunter's Point, uh, you know, they care about clean air for their kids. They care about global warming. They understand that it's a problem. But the number one concern is to have a good job that they can, of course, that they can have to support their family. So Apollo starts by talking about these incredible jobs that are going to be created through these clean energy industries of the future. And after people feel like they understand that and that they're supportive of that, 
they're the biggest environmentalists you've ever met. Think big. You'll uh, you gotta um, you gotta you gotta play big if you wanna win big. <laughs>